Artificial intelligence is already part of our daily lives, but we are still only beginning to understand its full potential. Lubna Bouarfa, a scientist, tech pioneer and CEO, is pushing the boundaries of our knowledge, convinced AI is a game changer when applied to matters of health, not only saving time and saving money, but also saving lives. Travel restrictions due to COVID-19 meant we could not meet Lubna in person. Market. But technology and creativity came to the rescue. Lubna, many thanks for joining us on Disrupted. It's a real pleasure to finally get to meet you. Um, so tell me, in very simple terms, what's artificial intelligence? Uh, thank you, Isabel. Um, artificial intelligence are systems that can learn from observations and store those observations in memory and leverage this uh, memory to help us uh, to create more awareness in the environments. It mimics the way we learn as human beings by observing, adapting and learning from our environment. Okay, so in learning from our environment and so in some respects it's quite personal, although many of us would think that artificial intelligence is the opposite. But, but tell us, what connects you to AI? Um, Different things connect me to AI, but the most personal connection to me is growing up with uh, in, a, in a loving family uh, and one of my siblings uh, is severely autistic and uh, growing up with him I've learned from an early age that the rules and the norms that society um, impose on us are just uh, generic perceptions are not representing the full spectrum of life and my fascination for AI is uh, coming from that there is no rules or norms. Uh, I, I've learned uh, that you can be many things and being autistic is one of them. And by having systems that, uh, that can impose rules and whether in engineering or in other fields, it almost puts uh, people and uh, differences in a box. Uh, however, having this uh, technology that can learn and adapt, it helps us as human beings uh, to be more open and uh, learn from the environment and embrace uncertainty much more. And, and for me, that's very honest uh, way and uh, uh, good philosophy for life. It's something we share, isn't it, Lubna? Because as you know, my, my son has autism too. But how did you go, go into that journey? How, how did your journey into artificial intelligence begin? It started actually 20 years ago when uh, I started my engineering de degree and I loved uh, science and maths. Uh, but what I didn't like about engineering back then was the fixed rule based uh, side of it. It was all rule based programming and you have to define the rules of any uh, design you are making until I come across uh, AI and, and machine learning where okay, we're not imposing any rules, we're gonna learn from patterns and uh, train machines to learn and adapt. And then I embarked in a PhD project uh, 13 years ago to build a cockpit for the operating room, so an AI system that can observe the surgeon, learn from different uh, signals in the operating room and infer what is he doing and if there's any deviations from the protocol. It is fascinating what you're saying, but just explain to me then in real terms what this means, because it seems quite theoretical. So if I'm a patient and I'm going to see the doctor, how would AI change my experience? In different ways. Um, imagine that uh, in an ideal scenario, your data uh, since birth is being collected and uh, many other patients, their data has been collected. So AI could be uh, computing similarities, observing many patients similar like you, similar like others. Think of it as a traffic light. Uh, and uh, if we can, in real time be able to measure the different risks for all patients. When there is a red flag, then an AI system can trigger that and you can get a letter to do some more tests. And uh, in this way, we leverage your data of similar patients like yourself to be able to tell you what is the best course of action. And more than that, to tell you what is the best treatments that will work for you uh, as a unique person uh, by learning from all patients similar like you. This Al algorithms don't stop, they keep computing and they keep uh, suggesting what you can do. So it's almost, we don't need to wait for people to get sick. Our healthcare systems with AI can become more proactive and leverage this data to advise patients and to, uh, to keep them healthy. 
So, so a medical practitioner using AI would be able, by looking at this data, predict uh, potential outcomes and treat them before they develop? Is, is that what would happen? Yeah, so the medical practitioner's role uh, will be getting all the evidence and not only base their decision on the 15 minutes they got to meet you when you go for a consultation. There will be uh, all the data about you and your family history, as well as patients that are similar to you, leveraged to um, compute your risks for the different diseases. We're not going to make machines that replace doctors, but we're going to make machines that empowers them. And I think uh, that is also the, the revolution that's happening in healthcare. The doctor's role will move from um, uh, kind of full capacity to focus on the important parts in the patient. Has there been a change in mentality when it comes to the medical community to embrace this, or is there a sense of uh, mistrust when it comes to artificial intelligence uh, and their work? I'm very optimistic. I saw in the last 10 years a lot of change uh, in adoption. There are barriers, definitely, and the barriers are two um, that I can summarize. The first barrier is the lack of data, where we can train those AI algorithms. Um, there is uh, the data that we have in the healthcare space, especially in Europe, is not collected to uh, build AI systems or collected to bring evidence. They are collected for transactional purposes, like for claims, for payments of drugs, uh, but uh, the second one is a tunnel vision. Patients want to get better. Doctors want to treat the patients. Payers want to reimburse drugs that are uh, uh, cost effective. And regulators want to make the rules that make sure that it's uh, uh, consistent. So, but then they all forget the goal is one. The goal is to treat that patient as fast as possible. And it is an injustice when, as a patient, there is a drug that can save your life and you can get hold of that because maybe it's not approved in your country or because your uh, doctor maybe doesn't know about that this drug will be the, the, the best for you and then you're lost in translation. Okay, so then I'm going to ask you to fast forward, let's say, 30, 40 years. Describe to me uh, briefly and in very simple terms, what a patient experience will be uh, when they go and see their practitioner. Are we talking, well, you know, will we st still see a doctor face to face or, or, or will that have changed entirely? So it's 2050 and uh, someone is born. As soon as this baby is born, routine checks will be performed. Their um, genetic screening happens and imagine there is a uh, mutation in an important gene. So as soon as that's detected, alarms goes on, parents are briefed on the process that's going to follow and the care that they need to provide for their child. Imagine that um, this child uh, grew up fine and at some point uh, the AI algorithm has been monitoring their states and it's, everything is green, 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 which is uh, uh, no risk for many diseases. But at some point uh, there is um, an orange or a light uh, uh, or a red light coming that they have a risk for lung cancer. Then they will get a letter and they will say, now you need to have an LDCT scan. And uh, as soon as the, the LDCT scan is performed, other AI algorithms will analyze and uh, whether it is a positive or negative test. If it is a positive test, then the human uh, comes in the picture, the doctor, uh, because you don't want an algorithm to tell the patients they have cancer. Uh, you need a human being to be transferring those uh, moral values. While the doctor performing this job, AI algorithms will be running in the back end and computing what is the best treatment for these patients. And once uh, after treatments, we still have algorithms running and, and predicting if there's any relapses and uh, automating the whole process. But Lubna, does this not raise just a whole host of ethical questions, especially when you're talking about data and people's health, uh, predicting illness? Uh, what needs to be put in place to make sure that isn't abused? Uh, there are different ways that we can uh, make sure that the data is not abused. Uh, one way is to not use personal data in the training of AI algorithms, to exclude all personal data. And AI systems are mostly uh, trained uh, with an identifiable, uh, anonymized data. Uh, and uh, as part of the high-level experts group, uh, where I was one of the 52 experts advising the European Commission on the ethical 
uh, guidelines for AI. We make sure the, the privacy of data is, uh, uh, is uh, safeguarded, is around the robustness of the AI system that it needs to be accurate uh, before we deploy it in an environment, especially in, in healthcare, which is critical, to make sure it's um, unbiased towards uh, different uh, patient groups or different um, uh, kind of uh, uh, gender or uh, sp specific disease areas, and making sure that the AI is explainable, especially in healthcare, that's very important. In terms of AI in Europe, um, how developed is that data space, uh, and to what extent is it hampering innovation? So it is um, true that data in Europe is, is one of the big limitations that uh, we are lacking data. The European Health Data Space is an initiative that's a number of member states working on it to uh, map this data together. But we are in a um, very early stage and compared to other countries where data is more available, like in the US, you could see that a lot of decisions, uh, decision making that is happening is because uh, we are using data from the US. We don't have much of European data that fits our patients patient population that can help us uh, individualize medicine here in Europe. And I think that is the, 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 the next important step that needs to happen before we can uh, scale the use of AI in healthcare systems in Europe. We often hear about bias when it comes to algorithms, bias when it comes to data. Uh, how does that impact then uh, artificial intelligence when it comes to health? Par bias is part of our lives uh, and bias happens every day. Uh, in healthcare, when you go to the doctor, um, he's a human being as much as he, uh, he tries to be as objective as possible, but he also um, judges the patient in front of him. And uh, so th that's not something we can completely exclude. And because AI systems are not rule-based, they are learning from the observations. If they are trained with uh, historical data, they will also get the bias from the bias that happened in the past. But the good thing is that we can see that bias now. With AI, we can now uh, detect this bias and um, uh, adapt the systems to exclude it. Uh, now, you've said that AI can rectify issues of diversity when it comes to algorithms. And if I look at your own company, Okra, it seems very important for you to have a very diverse team of colleagues working with you. Why is that important? When you have a diverse team uh, building an AI system, you already reduce bi bias by design. Uh, so um, the way we see what, uh, what needs to be articulated to the user, uh, how data needs to be processed, but from different angles, not having just engineers, but also, also designers and ethicists that are developing that framework, it brings more uh, the system to be uh, less biased. Another uh, element why it is important is designing a system that is inclusive for everybody. The user experience is uh, pleasant for both male and female, for both technical people and less technical people. So having a team that is diverse makes the AI system more in inclusive for everyone. Your journey into AI began with a very personal story, that of your brother. What would you say to a young person who wanted to make their career in artificial intelligence? I think for every person who wants to um, embark into AI, uh, don't try to force yourself into um, one aspect of AI, like the programming aspect or the engineering aspect. AI is a spectrum of things. There are many aspects to AI than just the programming part. There is the design, the creativity. Uh, there is also the ethics uh, of designing those systems, the user interface. Uh, so it has, it's a multicultural domain. And wherever you start, if you follow your passion, and uh, it, you can lead your career uh, path to AI because we need all the uh, uh, genius and the experts to add value and make AI more inclusive and more beautiful. Lubna, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. I wish we could have talked for longer, but many thanks for joining us on Disrupted. My pleasure, Isabel. Thank you for having me here.